Hello and welcome to this edition of Group Talk, Climbing the Beanstalk, a gentle transition from Lotus Script to Java Beans. You'll be hearing from Tim Tripconi of GBS and Howard Greenberg and Paul De La Nebbia of TLCC. Without further ado, here's Howard. Uh, just a brief advertisement before we start the webinar uh, from TLCC. Uh, we have uh, currently have uh, a broad curriculum of X Pages courses. Uh, from JavaScript to uh, advanced XPages development and mobile XPages. And we do have a variety of learning methods. We do have, all those courses are self-paced, uh, but we also have some courses available in an instructor-led online format. Uh, we're actually we're doing a session today uh, on our uh, developing XPages course. And we also can do private on-site courses. Uh, everyone here today is most likely interested in Java at some point in the future, and we do have some unique Java courses for people who've never programmed in Java before coming out in the near future. Uh, we do want to extend this special offer to all the attendees. If you go to tlcc.com slash webinar, you can get 20% off on any TLCC course through the end of the month. Uh, just a couple things coming up that everyone might be interested in depending on your uh, location. Uh, there is a user group meeting in uh, the New England area. There's also a really good, a uh, couple of real good sessions uh, in Belgium and Germany coming up at the end of March. Uh, the BLUG group uh, is a two-day event that has a number of speakers. Uh, that uh, will be presenting on a number of topics, both development and admin. And the Entwickler camp in uh, near Dusseldorf will be the next week after that. And that uh, is three days. And there also are a number of uh, X pages topics there, as well as other developer and admin. And finally, for the uh, people on the other side of the, uh, of the world, uh, the Oslug uh, group is going to be uh, kicking off in March 29th and 30th, and there are a number of speakers going to be there from you know around the world, and that's going to be a, a really good event as it was last year. And finally, we do have uh, our, uh, our X series. Every month we have uh, some topic on X pages. The next one in April will be a repeat of our going mobile uh, webinar, uh, which will cover the uh, new mobile XPages controls available in the IBM uh, Update Pack 1. And then we also have a number of IBM speakers in May speaking about the social controls that were added to XPages. So some great topics coming up there. OK, so I'm going to turn things over to Tim. Uh, this, uh, just to introduce him, uh, I've heard Tim give this talk at the uh, IM Lug in St. Louis last summer. And I, I just remembered it. it being a great discussion for the vast majority of us, you know, non-Java people who've been doing Domino for years, doing Lotus Script, as a way to start thinking about how to make this move to Java and Java Beans as part of our XPages uh, transition. So we got Tim to do it as a webinar. I'm looking forward to uh, hearing Tim, and I think it will be very informative for everyone. So Tim, I'm going to make you the presenter. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Tim Tripconi, and uh, just a little bit about me before we proceed. Uh, my nickname is Xmage. Uh, Nathan Freeman gave me that nickname, but it uh, it is actually now my official job title. So um, I'm a recovering Lotus Script developer. I currently have over three years of sobriety, and. Uh, my job at GBS is I serve as the technical lead for the Transformer UX development team. And so basically what that means is that I spend all of my time developing custom X page components that uh, try to bridge the gap between the types of stuff that we took for granted uh, when we were doing those client development. Uh, between that and what, what just ships out of the box with X pages, so so the library we provide for that, uh, in many cases, extends either the uh, the core components in X pages, or the extension library components. Uh, some something I didn't list on on this slide is that I'm also the co-author of the upcoming X pages extension library book that discusses uh, the 
the bulk of the controls that are available in that library. I do have a blog, uh, and the address, uh, as you can see there, is uh, just xmage.gbs.com. So what we're going to be talking about today is a, an incremental evolution from the, the kind of Lotus script development that uh, we're pretty much all familiar with to the type of classical structures that, uh, that make it easiest to leverage your business logic inside your X pages. So we're going to start from the ground up uh, with the, the type of structures that we all came from. Uh, and then little by little, we're going to make just some incremental shifts but we're also going to take a look at uh, what, what's the point of all this? What are we trying to accomplish and why? So where do we all start from? And um, if, if we set aside the notion of formula language, programmatically where, where we all start typically is procedural Lotus script. And this isn't just where we all begin, but some of us are still here, and that's fine. Uh, this session doesn't assume any understanding of any other code structures. So just want to want to get that out of the way right up front. So what does procedural code look like? Primarily what it looks like is that all of the code that you define exists wherever it's triggered. So if you're writing an agent, all of the code is placed directly within the initialized sub. If you're coding a button, it all exists in the click sub. And then we have, um, in, in notes client development, we have events like uh, the query save event in forms. Now, I want to stress that there are some advantages to this model. The primary advantage is that it's very easy to find the code because all of the code exists directly where it's triggered. There's no mystery about what a button does. You open up the click sub of a button, and there's its code. You don't have to go jumping around to 23 different places to, to wrap your head around what a button does. Another advantage is that bugs are typically isolated to the event that triggers it. So if you have a bug in a button, that's self-contained only that button is broken. However, there are some limitations to this. If a button's code becomes really complex, then the code for that button becomes enormous. So one of the issues with this is that it becomes really difficult to troubleshoot your bugs. So if I set a variable incorrectly in line 3, but it doesn't actually blow up until I hit line 300, it's going to be very difficult for me to, to rapidly determine what the nature of the problem is. Another limitation in this model is the duplication is guaranteed, but it can be hard to detect that. Because if, if all of the code is isolated to wherever it's triggered, you may have one button that does something very similar to another button and you're, you're doing some duplicate operations between the two. But since everything's isolated to wherever it's triggered, it's very difficult to detect that you have that duplication. So for these and other reasons, procedural code becomes very difficult to maintain, particularly as uh, an application's processes grow in complexity. So where do we go from there? Well, the next platform. Tim, can I interrupt you just? Yes. Tim, can I interrupt you just for a moment? A uh, couple of uh, attendees asking you to speak up, if you could. Maybe it's your oh. microphone position. Certainly. Oh, that's better. Okay. So, typically, the next plateau from procedural Lotus script is functional Lotus script. So, let's think a bit about what the attributes of, of functional code are. Basically, what this consists of is 
identifying whatever your common operations are and then extracting those into reusable functions. So again, if, if I have two buttons that do almost the same thing, but there's, there's just a couple subtle differences, then I can take whatever is, is common and define a function that I'm going to call from both buttons, and then I'll just pass in what the function should do differently based on which button initiated that function. So another way of thinking about this is that we're, we're decomposing complex procedures into several operations. So this isn't just trying to, to remove duplication, but it's also taking a look at the, this button technically only does one thing, but what is that one thing made up of? So if, for example, you have a button that approves a uh, a purchase request, then there's a number of things that have to happen there. You're most likely going to be updating field values. You may be creating entirely new documents. You're probably going to want to send an email. So you look at these operations that that the the single procedure is comprised of, and then if you split those out into s separate functions, then each of those can only do one thing, and then then your button just just walks through those. Now, when we say that each function only does one thing, we may find that each of those is made up of several so-called sub-things. So, um, sending an email that's that's fairly fairly concrete, right? But what if we have to update a bunch of data? that step, that, that procedure makes a good function, but the type of data and, and the amount of data that it's updating might be easily split into, into several, several functions of their own. So there are some advantages to this kind of decomposition, one of which is that your code starts to read like natural language. So again, if, if, you, if you have something that that is approving a request, but it's also sending an email, and you define functions that are named to approve request and send email, you may end up with a button that its code is just approve request and send email. So instead of the code all being wherever it's triggered, you might end up with code that whatever initiates the event, it all just reads like English, you know, or whatever your natural language is. But when you dig into those specific functions, that's where you see the code that's actually executed. So as you start to, to standardize some of these typical behaviors, you're going to end up with less duplication. That's always good because you can apply your fixes and your enhancements to a single function definition, and then those are going to boil up to everywhere that those those standard procedures are called. So all of your code is going to benefit from, from that central definition. But another advantage is that it's easier to wrap your head around smaller procedures. If everywhere you go in the code, the most that you ever see is 15 to 20 lines, it's very easy to grasp what's going on there you may have to do some exploring to find out what all of those discrete operations do. But as you're inheriting a new application or you're revisiting one that you haven't looked at the code in a year, but now all of a sudden they want to add a feature or maybe some bug has, has crept up, it's much easier to look at those smaller operations and see, oh, this is, this is exactly what it's doing. I don't have to scroll for three minutes just to, to get to the end of this code. And finally, our bugs are now isolated to, to concrete operations. So rather than having this one approve request button where I know something's going wrong somewhere in there, we can isolate it to, oh, the bug is just 
sending an email or it's just updating the data. Uh, we can we can isolate those bugs. Now there is one growing pain with this. As we start to centralize our functions, we can have distributed impact for our bugs. So whereas they used to be isolated to a specific button or a specific form event, it is possible now that a bug could crop up in a dozen different places because each of those events all calls the same function. But of course there's a flip side to that. The good news is that once you identify what the fix needs to be, you fix it in one place and that then provides distributed relief. So from functional LotusScript, how do we make another incremental shift that allows us to make our code more real? Now, we're going to step back for a moment from specific code structures and get a little bit philosophical here. As you're designing your code, think about what it actually creates or interacts with. And I'm not referring here specifically to Domino documents or, 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 or database applications, but, but actual people and, and processes or products that, that your code is, is designed to interact with or facilitate or, or create. Now, as you're thinking about each of these, ask whether or not it's primitive. Uh, in, in some contexts, you might also hear this term as uh, referred to as scalar. So what is primitive? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm missing a slide here. So in LotusScript, we only have three primitive types. We have numbers, we have text, and we have Boolean, and that's it. Now there are a bunch of different types of numbers. We have integer and byte and single and double and currency, but they're all numbers, right? For text, we only have a single type, and that's string. And for Boolean, for, for true and false values, Boolean is our only option. So across all of these data types that we're used to interacting with in LotusScript, really there's only three types of primitive data. There's numbers, there's text, and there's Boolean. And that's it. So if it's anything else, anything but those three, it's more complex and it should be treated as such. So how do we actually do that in LotusScript? Well, there's two options. One is referred to as a type. And this is something that doesn't get used much in LotusScript, to be honest. I don't see a lot of blog posts about it. I, I don't see a lot of example code out there that, that uses custom user types. But if, if you look in the, the designer help, it's, it's got a great write-up on this. A type is simply one thing that's comprised of other things. So we often refer to these things as properties. And then something that there's, there's a lot more documentation out there about is classes. And this is something that is common to a lot of programming languages. So the, the concept is out there. You probably heard about it. You may have some understanding of what exactly a class is. But all it really is is that it's something that supports properties but also behaviors. But we often refer to these behaviors as methods. But a key distinction is that classes often wrap the properties in methods. So rather than accessing or modifying those directly, we call methods to do those operations. And then that gives us an opportunity to define code that happens when you access or modify those properties. 
So before we dive into actual examples of, of this type of code, let's, let's continue to, to take a step back and think about why we might want to do that. So primitive data doesn't really exist in the real world. The, the closest we really come to encountering primitive data is if I have a birthday, I might be briefly aware that I'm one year older. So this November I'll turn 35. And so that's, that's a primitive data point, right? That's a number. But it has no meaning outside of the, the notion that it's a property of me. My age is, is one characteristic about me. But my age alone does not define me. There are so many other characteristics and so many other attributes of me that sure that that one data point is an interesting statistic, but it it has no meaning outside of it being one of many characteristics of, of what what make me up. Now, in more pragmatic terms, if we think about things like uh, a PIN number for a bank account, that's another primitive data point. But it's not something you want somebody changing without anything else occurring. You may have changed your own PIN number for a bank account online. And as a result, you got an email from your bank saying, just confirming that we wanted we wanted to confirm with you that, that you intended to change your PIN. Uh, so if you think of a PIN as a single primitive property of your bank account, there, there was some operation in your bank's system that when that property was modified, some additional code ran. And the result was you got an email, so you have an opportunity to intervene if that property ought not have been changed. But something we, we often don't think about is that even accessing a property can sometimes have consequences. Certainly for those of us in the US, but, but possibly in other, other countries as well, um, one property of our overall financial status is our credit score. Every time somebody accesses my credit score, it goes down. I personally think that's stupid, <laughs> but it does. That happens. So even accessing that property, even though it's not directly changing it, other stuff goes on, really complex stuff. So when, when you're thinking about that, of the, the properties really shouldn't just be accessed directly or just modified directly without an opportunity for other stuff to happen. Why? Why should I bother restructuring my code to, um, to support that? Well, <clears throat> there are a number of opportunities that we have here. One is that shifting from procedures to functions, but also from functions to classes, gives us an opportunity for more reusability of our code. So functions encapsulate individual behaviors. So again, defining one function for sending an email allows me to encapsulate that behavior. And then once I've defined that, I can call it from anywhere, and I don't have to rewrite that code over and over again. But classes take it to even the next level. So we're encapsulating the nature of entire objects. But that also includes object state. So different objects based on the same class can maintain different values for their properties at the same time. So I could have 
hundreds of different bank account objects in memory, and then each one can have a different PIN number, a different balance, a different list of transactions. And so this allows us to dramatically simplify the way that we approach our, our variable management. Because rather than having all of those separate properties for each class stored as separate variables, we encapsulate all of them into a single property, a single variable for one class. And then we let the class instance keep track of its own properties. Another advantage is with inheritance. So a class can extend another class. Uh, that's the terminology that's used in Java. So one example is that a Cooper is a mini, is a car, is a vehicle, is a machine. So I could define, a, if I wanted to define everything that a Mini Cooper is and can do, I might start at the level of, well, what's a machine? What do all machines have in common? And then gradually work my way up to what do all Mini Coopers have in common? But that example is getting a little carried away. I just wanted to put out there that you can go that deep. But the rule of thumb is create your common base classes at the point where you know you're going to have duplication. If you start to do that too much in advance, then you're actually adding additional unnecessary effort, which is one of the things we're specifically trying to avoid. Uh, another pragmatic benefit is that this dramatically improves your ability to troubleshoot your code. Because now, not only are, are bugs isolated to specific behaviors like they are with functional programming, but often it's behaviors of a specific object. So the bug might, might not be that every time you send an email, something goes wrong, but only when a specific object tries to. So that makes it a lot easier to identify patterns and get to the bottom of what's going on. Now, again, this can cause a distribution of the impact of bugs, because if, if you have a lot of different places that are, that are invoking the same class, then your bug you know, is spread. But again, you fix it in one place, it fixes, it fixes it everywhere, instead of having to go back to 37 different buttons and fix the bug everywhere. But an ironic advantage of this shift is that it actually gives us an opportunity for renewed familiarity. And, and there's, there's two facets to this. As I mentioned, we don't actually encounter primitive data in the real world. We only encounter properties of complex objects and complex people. But also, if you've ever written Lotus script code, you've already used classes. You may have never written one, but I can almost guarantee you've used at least one. Because if you've ever instantiated an obsession, you've used a Lotus script class. If you've ever written data to a notes document. So in other words, the product thinks in objects. So we should too. But going beyond just we we develop domino applications, so we should think the same way that domino thinks about these things. We're humans. We, everything we interact with, every person we interact with is complex. Every business process we're trying to streamline is complex. So when we're writing procedural code, we're doing something that differs from the way we handle everything else. So when we get away from thinking about individual field values, and, and we go back to thinking about what is my code actually trying to do and why? Who are the people using it? What are the business processes that this application is, is facilitating? And what are the products or customers or, or accounts or you know, what, what are these tangible or intangible objects that it's interacting with? it reconnects us with why we were hired in the first place. 
we if if you've ever heard uh, your employer complaining that IT seems to be disconnected from the business, this is one of the ways that we can individually help that. Because if we stop thinking about the data, obviously the data is crucial. That's a record of, of, of what took place. But if we stop thinking about the data, and we're thinking in terms of what, what are the people and what are the processes and the objects that, that this code is about, then we're more connected to the business. And the data is, is just a natural side effect of that. So we, we've taken this incremental evolution, going from procedures to functions to classes. So let's take a look at what this actually looks like in our code. So let's go ahead and reset and go back to procedural. So this is a very simple procedure. I'm just creating an employee record. I'm setting some discrete field values and then I'm saving that in the application. Very simple procedure. All of the code is here, so I don't have to go anywhere else to figure out what's going on. But it's easy to understand what's going on here because it's less than 15 lines of code. So let's just make one little shift here to go from procedural to functional. So what is this code actually doing? I can't tell from looking at the name of the code. The name is initialized, so it's obviously starting something. What it's doing is creating an employee record. So let's name that. So I've created a function, and it tells me exactly what it's intended to do. So we're going to pass in a few items that, that indicate how it should do it, so that we can call this from anywhere and tell it how it should behave differently based on what is asking it to do its job. Now inside that function it's still the same exact operation. But if you glance down a little further, getting a handle on the current database is something we do all the time. Now that's not a complex thing, it doesn't require a lot of, uh, a lot of code to do it, but it requires a few lines and we do it all the time. So why not define a function that we can call from anywhere to do that? So if you jump back to the, to the top, you see that we're calling that sort of universal function, get current database. So finally, when we go back to whatever code is initializing this process, now it's just one line. So if this were in a button or this were in an agent, when I'm in initially inheriting this application, I can visit every place that initializes code, and it will tell me exactly what it does, because I've now named the code. But again, all of this is reusable now, because if creating an employee record is something that many different pieces of the application have to do, then I can, I can call this one function from anywhere. So we've already, just with a tiny shift, made our code easier to understand and easier to reuse. Tim, uh, th this is Paul. Can you go back to the previous slide there? So a um, couple of problems that I'm having, and, and I, let me frame this with, I really do think top-down procedurally. <laughs> so I am very, very guilty of that approach, and I've written those 300-line scripts. Uh, and, and for me, I have to, that's the way I think when I'm programming. So, um, you know, one problem that I have when I'm looking at someone else's code, and boy, this makes a lot of sense when I look at your code here, uh, the way you've broken it up. But one problem I have is, oh, now I've got to go somewhere else to find it. Um, you, know, what, you know, what, where create employee record is defined. Uh, another problem is, you know, those two functions, Presumably, if they're in the same library, 
um, just the order in which they are. I don't have that familiar top-down um, construction that I'm used to. So can you comment on that and how I get over that and how I evolve to you know, a more object approach? Certainly. It's the, this middle, middle ground is sort of, um, and I hate to use such a loaded term, but it's sort of the programmatic adolescence, right? That's the awkward period where you're, you're going between just this procedural, you know, it's like old basic, right? Where you, you didn't, you didn't split code out in basic. It was just line 10, line 20, and it was all there. Um, so as, as you're shifting to functional programming, it often gets a little chaotic. Um, because I've, I've seen and I've maintained many script libraries that you end up with a hundred different functions defined in a single script library because at some point somebody decided, oh, this would be a useful function. And more often than not, you end up with uh, 15 different functions that all essentially do the same thing. But whoever created the duplicate function, for whatever reason, didn't happen to notice that there's already a function that does that. And so they created a new one, and it's named something slightly differently. But essentially, it's the same code. So the, probably the best advice I can give you on that front is just like with adolescence, try to get through it as quickly as possible. <laughs> because the, there are advantages to the functional approach. But really, if, if you can push past that to just, just one more shift, to think of it in terms of objects, then a lot of the issues that we tend to have with functional go away. Because, again, we're, we're starting to then encapsulate these functions into, now it's not just this one isolated, one isolated operation of creating an employee record or whatever. Uh, but it's the behavior of an employee. I, mean, I, I, I think that'll be revealed in the next couple slides. Um, so if we look at defining types, again, this is just a thing that's made up of things. So here's a real oversimplified type, but uh, an employee is a person and therefore is going to have a name, but something not every person has is an employee ID, but an employee will. They're also going to have a job title, and we might want to keep track of their employment status. So now if we look at this create employee record, if we jump back to this previous slide, we were passing in uh, their identity, their job title, etc. So we've got four different arguments for this function. Now all of a sudden if we create a type, we have one. Ironically, if you compare the initialized sub between these two slides, it looks like we've now made our code more complex. But we've actually made it less brittle because, and it, it's it's a little, little clear what's going on. I'm, I'm dimming, dimming this variable as a type. Um, and so now I'm setting properties of it. I'm, I'm specifically saying this is an employee and here's his name. But where this simplifies things a bit is now I can just pass in that employee and now my function has everything it needs to know. So the advantage of that really is simply that I no longer care about the order of arguments. If I flip the first name and last name in this example, I'm going to get results I don't want. In this example, it doesn't matter what order I set the first name and last name in because those are properties, and the type keeps track of that for me. So I just pass in the employee, 
and then I, I don't have to worry about remembering is, oh, do I pass the last name first or the first name? I don't have to remember that anymore. I create an employee, I, I set the attributes, and then I pass that to the function and it knows what to do. But if we, the, the limitation is the employee, we can know stuff about them. But the employee can't do anything on their own. So here's where the shift comes, where functions start to become more intelligent. So if we define an employee class, if you look at the, these first few lines and compare it to the type, it's basically the same thing, except that we can now lock these properties down as being private. So for example, these functions get first name and set first name. All they're doing is, is accessing and modifying the property value. But in a real world application, this is the point where in the set first name or set last name, this is where you might want to intervene and say, oh, we have to now uh, update their access to everything because they're being renamed or anything else that has to happen. So now we've got an update record that is a behavior of the employee. So, but you notice we've, we've actually marked it as private. And that's because the employee knows how to write its own data back to the database. So we no longer have to call that directly. The class is has its own intelligence. It has its own behaviors. So instead of having all these individual functions that we have to jump around and find, if, if we just move these functions inside classes, now all of a sudden it makes a little more sense because the function is a behavior of an object or a behavior of a person or it's a, an operation of a business process. So it's, it's not these isolated functions that are all, all siblings to each other. The, these are behaviors of these bigger picture type things. So now when I define a new employee, instead of accessing the properties directly, I'm setting, I'm calling the setters for these properties. So my code that is initiating this doesn't have to know what happens when I, when I change an employee's name. Uh, it, it protects the, the calling code from that. And when I tell it to save, it's going to run this internal function of update record, although we don't see that in this example code. Sorry about that. Um, but what if all of a sudden, for some reason, we're told, well, we need to go with a, a standard naming, uh, naming convention for fields. So first name needs to be FA underscore 37. Well, this code doesn't have to care anymore. The code that, that exists wherever it's initiated no longer cares because that's been encapsulated into the behavior of our employee object. Our employee can now be smart enough to handle this. And we can just tell the employee, here's what your property should be, and then execute this operation. Hey, Tim. This yeah. is Howard. Uh, got a, a couple of questions and comments that kind of relate to um, using these classes, you know, as we start to make this transition. Uh, first of all, um, Vikram asked if there's any tool that we can use to easily navigate through these classes. And then Don kind of was helping Paul out and said it, um, one suggestion is to move your code to one script library and keep everything in one script library together. So I think that probably relates to using a tool. And then another question was, 
how do we uh, kind of remember all these attribute names? Well, one advantage of Domino Designer being based on Eclipse now is that uh, we actually have a, a pretty decent LotusScript editor. So um, what I would recommend is having your script libraries be based on related classes. You don't want to necessarily go all the way to having a separate script library for every class. But as you're defining your classes, you're going to identify relationships between them. And that, that's something else that's difficult about functional LotusScript is, is that occasionally you might notice, okay, well, we've got, got a string functions library, and that's all for string parsing. And then we've got another library that's for related things. But usually what happens is that eventually all of those functions just get slammed into a single script library. Um, so what I find to be best is when, when you're thinking in terms of objects, it, it becomes very easy then to think of the relationships between the objects, not necessarily between their behavior. So if you have a script library for each category of, of object, then you would define the classes in there. And then uh, at least within the script libraries and within agents, you're going to get pretty decent type ahead. So uh, remembering the properties and remembering the methods that are associated with those, the, the editor, at least in, in agents or when your script libraries are interacting with each other, you're going to get a decent type head. But unfortunately, the form editor and the view editor are not using the, the new Lotus script editors. So that um, that's another reason why it's great to keep the, the code to an absolute minimum at the place where it's actually executed, because that's usually one of these design elements where we don't have decent type ahead, certainly not for custom classes. Tim, I have so, a, a question. Okay. Can you go back to your employee class screen? Yeah. So uh, are there any um, templates for this where, you know, you, you've, you've got a, a very defined structure here that looks good to me. Um, you know, you're defining your, your, your um, uh, uh, variables at the beginning and then your getters and your setters. So are there templates for uh, the getters and the setters that I can just copy in and, and start to modify as I de develop my own classes? Well, Designer itself, or Eclipse rather, uh, allows you to define code templates so that every time you create a class, for example, it's it's going to um, but actually, and um, the, this is a the, the next step is making one final shift from this structure to an identical structure in Java. And when you're editing a Java class, it actually has the intelligence for that built in. So if I define a first name property, I now have to manually define the getter and setter for that. Um, but in Java, if I define a first name property, I can right click it, select source, and there's an option for generate getter and setter, and it just does it. And then of course, you know, internal of those methods, I would put in whatever, whatever logic is appropriate. But um, you can also, at once, define all the properties in a Java class, and then when you right-click, select source, and do generate getters and setters, there's a select all button. And when you click OK, you may have you may have defined a dozen properties, but now you've got your getters and setters for all of them. So the, the editor is just more robust for Java to begin with. Um, some, of course, would argue that's because it needs to be, but um, the, the designer preferences do allow you to set certain templates 
for every time I create a class, create it with this structure. But there are obviously limits to uh, to the usability of that, especially since every class is going to have different properties. So I'm going to just quickly jump back and forth between this slide and this one, mostly because I want <laughs> to reinforce how minimal the differences are between these. So at the top here, we're, we're defining private variables and giving each of them a type. And here we're doing the same thing. The biggest difference is it's a lowercase p on private and it's a semicolon at the end. But other than that, um, also string is, shows up in a different order. So instead of private employee ID as string, it's private string employee ID. But that's about it as far as the, the complexity of defining um, properties. But then if we look down uh, closer to the end of, of this slide, we've got getters for a couple of those fields. And again, some of the stuff is in different orders. So if we look at some of the getters over here, we have public function get first name as string. Here we've got a getter for an employee ID. So it, instead of as string being on the end, we put string a little further at the front. But again, it's basically the same exact structure. We define a private property, then we define getters for them, and also setters. So again, this is where if we had a getter for a credit score, we might need to go out and do some complex algorithm to determine what the credit score should be now. Um, similarly, if we had a setter for a pin on a bank account, then that's where the code might be for, for defining or sending out the email to um, to, to warn the, the account holder. But basically, it's, it's the same, same structure. We define some properties, and we define getters and setters for those. So now, we can, we can shove behaviors like, how do I load my data from the, from the database, and how can I update my data? So from outside, when we create a, a, an employee object, we can just call load and save. And it, as you see, as long as it knows what its unit is, then the employee has all the intelligence to, to be able to remember and recall. So what is a bean? Um, it's, it's a term that gets thrown around a lot when, when you're uh, reading about XPages, mainly because pretty much everything in XPages is based on Java beans. But all a bean is, is a, a class that conforms to bean conventions. And really, that's just two things. I mean, there, there's a couple other subtleties that, that you might uh, see in, in some contexts. But essentially, the two main things to keep in mind are you can construct instances of them without any parameters. Just like in LotusScript, we dim some object as a new note session. Uh, Java supports method overloading, so you could create a bean that has a constructor that does accept arguments, and then that might have some automatic behavior whenever an instance is constructed with those arguments. But at a minimum, for a, a Java class to be considered a bean, it has to support instantiation with no arguments. And then the only other convention that really becomes important is that we have these getters and setters. It's just this predictable naming. That if I define a first name property, I'm going to have a get first name and set first name. And one little caveat to that, if it's Boolean, 
then it's going to be like is active or set active. The setter is always set, but the getter is is if it's belonging. So the, the key is that if, if we get in the habit in our Lotus script of, of defining our code this way, we could be doing this for years before we ever write an X page. But when we do, if we want to use Java beans, it's porting our business logic to that is a matter of doing a copy paste and then replacing curly braces and, and semicolons and stuff like that. But the, the structure is going to be identical. So let's take a quick look at, at how you might actually reference one of these beans in an X page. So X pages have a notion of a repeat control and all repeats are is a, a wrapper that says, I'm going to define some stuff inside this, and I want you to, to, to make a copy of it for each member of some collection or array. So in this code example, we're just looping through an employee's view. And in our while loop, we get a handle on what the unit is for each. We construct an instance of an employee, and then we pass the unit to the load method. So uh, in this case, this is a, an overloaded load that doesn't accept the unit because we've already set it. But uh, So the, uh, the push here is we've created an empty array. We construct a new employee, we tell it to load its own data, and then we add it to the array. So now by the end of this block, we have a list of employees. And so then inside our repeat, we can bind controls directly to these bean properties. So um, you see these input texts here, they're just fields, just editable fields that I'm binding to properties like first name, last name, job title, etc. And the reason for the bean structure is so that in an X page, if I'm binding a control to the property name, at runtime, it's going to be able to tell whether I'm doing a read operation or a write operation. The X page is just going to know that for me. So when the page initially loads, that's going to be a read. So it's going to call the getter. So this, this field of um, that's bound to employee.first name, it's going to know, oh, for the first name property, I call get first name because this is a bean and that's what I do with beans. I have a getter. But if the user makes changes to that field and, and then they trigger some other event, now it's in a write operation, it, the data for that field is being posted back to the server. So it knows it needs to call the setter. So how that actually physically looks in an X page is we could have a row for each employee. Each of these fields is bound to a separate property of the bean. And so now I've got a basic in-view edit interface where each of these fields is bound to a property. Now, it's, it's easy to think, well, why not just bind them to the field? And if all we care about is the data, then that's great. But if we need complex stuff to happen, if somebody's name gets changed, then we have to have some whole separate other process that is defi defined on the X page. Sure, it might be defined in, in other libraries that we call from the X page, but there's this separation between the, 
the interface and 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 the behavior. Whereas if the employee knows what needs to happen when their name changes, by binding to the employee and not to the data, then if the employee's nature changes, if their job title changes, then then the employee does all the work in connecting to the HR system or sending out emails or you know whatever needs to happen. And we don't have to write a whole bunch of extra logic in our X page because the employee knows how to do all of that. Because we've written a class such that every time set job title is called, we go off and we do a whole bunch of other work. So we can plop that into any X page, and the X page doesn't need to know what happens when I change a job title, because the employee knows. This is, is kind of a, a different way of thinking about these things, so I'm guessing there are probably a few more questions at this point. Yeah, actually, there's a one kind of uh, right on point, and Jose asked, you know, okay, so this kind of assumes that we have a fairly complex application, but what about a simple application? Like, do we want to objectify everything, even though it will stay simple, or what's the dividing line? Any words of, of wisdom there, Tim? Well, I, I would say the, the rule of thumb is how do you know it's going to stay simple? Because sometimes we do. There, there are many situations where we're asked to build an application, and the process is defined, and the nature of the need for the application is such that it's only going to be used for a short period of time, and it's only used by a few people, and it, it, it does something very specific and precise and simple. But the the key i think is finding out from whoever the customer is whether internal or otherwise finding out what their vision is for the future and that may be fairly nebulous and that's fine maybe they've only defined what what they need right now but they have a vision for the future if they don't, if, if they don't have any intentions of this ever becoming more complex, then as I mentioned before, just like you don't want to create ridiculously deep inheritance hierarchies if you don't have to. Uh, just just create a common base class when, when you detect that you're encountering duplication. I'd say the, the same rule of thumb applies to uh, to how you're, you're going to structure the code in the first place. If it's a, a simple process where, a, a simple contact manager type app where people just need to create a, a contact record and say, and you're not, you're not anticipating anything ever being fired off uh, in response to that, then yeah, just go ahead and bind to the data. It's easier, it's quick, it's you know, there's no need to, to wrap it in all of this extra philosophy. But if that if there's any chance that that basic application could ever become a CRM, then it doesn't take too much longer to to write the types of basic classes that that are, are shown in the, these slides, maybe an hour at most, um, just to, to have a way to, I can bind the properties and and then then the class handles saving to, to the data. Um, so that kind of investment isn't, isn't huge, but then if they come back and say, oh, well, we want the data actually to be stored somewhere completely different. If that's the case, you don't actually have to change your X page at all. You just go into your class and say, oh, well, this isn't even stored in notes anymore. We store this in DB2 now, or we store this in SQL or whatever. Um, 
or they come back and say, well, every time this field changes, we need this process to kick off. Then again, you don't even have to touch the X page. You just go into your Java class and say, well, when this center is called, do this stuff. Um, so it, it, it's very subjective. Um, and, and sometimes we do know that an application will not grow more complex. But really, that's the key, is if, if we don't. And the investment up front to, to structure it as classes is very small. Um, it, it does pay off in the long run, because when, when they surprise you and come along and say, OK, we need to make this really convoluted now, having that structure already in place means that you don't then have to go back to the X page and completely rewrite it to use the new structure. You just go back to the, the class you already had and put in the new process. Um, and all of your user interface stuff doesn't have to change at all. Okay. Hopefully that that helps. I think that made a lot of sense. I have a question from Chris. Um, we're interested in creating an X page front end to an Oracle, Oracle database. Uh, does our model bean or beans contain the RDB connections and CRUD operations uh, to uh, update the uh, Oracle database data directly? Yes. You may want to abstract that out into other layers, but um, model is, is a term that you'll hear a lot in connection with XPages because XPages are an implementation of JSF or Java Server Faces, which is a spec that that um, tries to embody the notion of model view controller or MVC, where view is not what we tend to think of as, as domino views where it's indexes of data. View just means user interface. What, do, what does the user actually see? Model is what's your data model? What is the actual structure of the persistence layer of whatever the user interaction was? And then the controller is it tends to be your business logic. So as far as actually writing to and reading from Oracle, that the model being should should cover that. Uh, and actually something that um, it's kind of hard to find documentation on, but you can actually define your own custom data sources. When you're defining an X page, there's only two that that show up really is the you can define a domino document data source or a domino view data source but you can write a model being that you register in faces config and feel free to to email me questions of, about some of this wackier stuff uh, offline but if you register your model being in the faces config file in your NSF you can actually specify that as a custom data source. And so when you're binding your fields to that data source, you're binding it to your model bean, and then that, that's where your JDBC magic happens. OK. Um, I have another question from Mel. Um, have you guys written books on this stuff? Now, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, certainly not on specifically this transition of I, I'm a procedural Lotus Script programmer or I'm a functional Lotus Script programmer and I want to make the jump to Java beans. Um, I have not personally seen any books that, that focus on, on that sort of evolution. Now, Howard had mentioned that uh, TLCC is coming out with a couple of Java courses for X Pages, uh, and um, uh, the second course we come out with will be focusing on uh, the use of Bean. So um, look for that. A um, couple of uh, other questions, Tim, that were related. Um, in terms of where do we actually put these, these beans, 
Um, for example, one question was, do we save the Java classes in a JavaScript library or in the 854 jar design element? And if a jar, can it be accessed from a traditional Java agent? And a similar uh, question was, you know, should we build the structure in Java or server-side JavaScript? Ah. So kind of a little more on the technical implementation. Okay. So uh, let me tackle the, the, the first one. The, <laughs> there's a, a downside to the, the way that Java is handled in traditional agents in that each agent is essentially treated as a separate project. So um, a Java script library, which is very easily confused with JavaScript library, um, is, is essentially a jar that then is accessible from all agents. X pages are a completely different beast in that the NSF itself is considered a project. So in 853, part of the standard domino designer perspective is uh, a view part known as the package explorer. And that allows you to view the entire structure of the NSF as basically an Eclipse project, which is essentially just a folder structure. Uh, and if, if you open up that view part and uh, go to the bottom, you'll see a, a folder titled Web Content. And inside that folder is a, a folder titled Web-INF. What is recommended for defining classes local to an NSF is to create a new SRC or source folder inside that web INF folder, and then right-click it, select build path, add, uh, use as source folder. And then you put all of your classes in there. Now, anything that you define in, in one of the new Java design elements in 8.5.3 will also be accessible to any X page, but not to agents. Um, but not to, to be too negative, but the new Java design element, in my opinion, the implementation is buggy. So I, I never use it. I still just manually create my own source folder, and I add it to the build path. Um, interestingly enough, depending on the, if you use specific naming for that, you can actually expose all those classes as job design elements, but again, I, I wouldn't take that approach. Um, so it does become difficult to reuse Java code between agents and X pages. But I personally haven't been too inconvenienced by that because Java agents uh, tend to be great, for, at least in XPage applications, are great for background processes, scheduled agents and such. Um, but Java classes that you're accessing via an XPage, that's front-end type stuff. I mean, sure, it's, it's your, your data model and your business logic controller type stuff, which would, would probably be useful for, for scheduled type stuff. But if uh, you go out to OpenNTF, uh, you'll find a, a project known as DOTS, uh, the Domino OSGI Task Scheduler, or Task Servlet, Tasklet Service, sorry. Um, trying to, to remember that. It's the, um, the Domino OSGI Tasklet Servlet Service. And what that does is allows you to create schedulable and triggerable Java tasks that live outside of the NSF. So they become reusable across applications, but of course they can be designed to just be for a specific app. Um, they perform extremely well, especially compared to uh, 
to standard Java agents because it doesn't have to spin up a new JVM every time. Um, and and if you define OSGI plugins, and there's a lot of documentation on this out on on the Designer Wiki. Uh, it is a little advanced, but if you look at the XSP starter kit, um, and sorry, Declan and Dave, gonna go ahead and volunteer you to <laughs> to be go-to guys on this because they've they've used that that project a lot. Open NTF project called XSP starter kit is great. Um, great way to get into building OSGI plugins. If you put those on the server, then anything in those are reusable um, within both uh, dots tasks and XPage apps. So, um, so the more that you push in that direction, the more that you can leverage code in, in your schedulable and triggerable events and your end user interface type uh, type applications. Okay, uh, we are over time, but I can tell there's still 75% of us who are, are sticking around, so <laughs> folks are, are certainly interested, but we will have to end this shortly. Um, so uh, maybe just uh, another question each. Um, uh, first of all, uh, David Leedy has pointed out that there's some good introduction to Java uh, videos available on XPages TV. Uh, thanks for that reminder, David. Definitely. And a uh, question from uh, Ashwin, is there an automated way to convert uh, existing Lotus script into the Java Beans model? <laughs> um, technically there is. And uh, if, if you'll permit me the advertisement, um, the the team that I'm on is is the the App UX team for our transformer technology. We um, we have created a, a Lotus Script emulator. So um, if if you're using the transformer technology, you actually don't have to um, convert your Lotus Script to Java because if you're defining the Lotus Script inside an X page then it runs as Java at runtime. But that's um, that that only works if if you're using our emulator. Um, I don't know of any any technology that specifically converts Lotus Script to Java in the sense of taking something from an existing design element and converting it to a Java design element that you can then maintain going forward. Can we just send it to you, Tim? Sure. <laughs> oh, you have it? <laughs> no, no, no. Our, our code for you to convert. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> How um, did you? <laughs> I'll retract that, that question. Feel free to contact our sales department. <laughs> <laughs> Howard, did you have any more questions? Well, uh, Leah, one last uh, question. Uh, what about the performance aspect of all this? Like in the slide that you have on the screen now, um, Tim, you got the bean behind all these fields, and that's in a repeat. And let's say we have you know thirty or forty rows. Uh, yep. how, how's the performance compared to just binding these to the underlying data source? I guess we would uh, have to uh, somehow have forty different data sources set up if we had this, you know, in a didn't use a bean, right? That's absolutely right. Um, so technically, this performs better. There's um, uh, there are certain types of components that can contain data sources in an X page. So obviously, the view root, the XP view tag, uh, can can hold data sources, but panels also can as well. So uh, just a, a very side topic is that um, that if if you're used to creating panels for all your containers, don't just do divs, unless it's something that you want to attach a data source to locally. So for this type of interface, what you would do if you wanted to bind directly to the fields is you would bind a repeat just to say just to a view data source, 
and then inside the repeat you would create a panel that has data source that is setting its document ID to each unit it's passed or each node ID. Uh, so then yeah for every document it has to to create a separate uh, separate data source, separate panel, etc. So there's actually a, a, a minor performance uh, cost to that. Uh, unless you have high volume usage, you're probably not even going to notice a difference because there's a lot of efficiency built into that. But, um, uh, but Paul, one fast of uh, of Paul's question that, that I, I forgot to cover is uh, what about creating these object structures in SSGS? It's very valid. Uh, we want to keep SSGS to a minimum wherever possible and the reason is because every single SSGS evaluation on an X page has to spin up a whole AST uh, which is short for abstract syntax tree because um, SSGS obviously isn't compiled so what happens is it's stored as a string all the way up to the point where the X page needs to know what it evaluates to. And at that precise moment, it parses the string and says, oh, what, what is the abstract, you know, language independent syntax of this? Well, I, I see an equal sign in JavaScript that means assignment. So I, I have an assignment operator. And it, it's, it's, it's parsing all that and, and eventually it comes up with this interpretation of it that it knows what the variables are and the assignments and the method calls and all that that is independent of language. And then it can run Java code that's equivalent to that. Um, so if, if you're just you know, binding to bean values, it doesn't have to guess. It doesn't have to parse or interpret anything other than these really basic straightforward expressions. So binding to, to beans instead of to SSGS um, gives you a performance benefit every time. Um, it's easier to define SSGS objects because of the fluid nature of the JavaScript language. Um, but you do pay a performance penalty for that. Um, but again, the um, the incremental differences you're not going to notice unless it's a a really complex app that has really high volume. One of the benefits of XPages is you can create some just ludicrously uh, scalable apps, so we can ask Domino to, to do stuff that we never would have dared to before. Um, but if you're going to be doing that, then you want to squeeze out every optimization you can. Okay, thanks, Tim. Uh, well, I think we're going to wrap it up at this point. Uh, I'd like to thank Tim for doing this webinar. It was very informative, and uh, I know I, I got some things to think about in my own code, let alone, you know, I'm sure everyone else out there in terms of, you know, the, the thought process going forward. So I'd like to thank everyone for attending. I'm sorry we went a little bit over. Uh, we will be putting out, and as we said, uh, an e there will be an email with a link to the recorded uh, video as well as the uh, slides going out in the next uh, day or so. So I uh, hope everyone has a great rest of their day or evening and, and uh, we'll catch you at the next webinar in April. Thanks everyone. And that concludes this edition of Group Talk. Thanks for watching. To engage in conversations with us, visit twitter.com slash gbsnotes. To stay up to date, like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash joingbs. And to watch entertaining and informative videos, visit youtube.com slash gbsnotes. And don't forget, visit our website and send us an email at gbs.com and info at gbs.com. Thanks again.